My name is Maitri Sita Raman. I am um, an anchor with Euro News Television and also the, the co chair for Fortune Most Powerful Women. Um, can I ask on stage Sixteen Buig? She is Deputy Director, General Communications at the European Commission. Uh, Fabian Arata is Country Manager for France at LinkedIn. Thank you, Fabian. Can I also get Clement Leonard Dutzi? He is President of France at Publicis Consultants. Thank you. Um, can I also invite on stage um, Mercedes Colwyn? She is Senior Partner at Gordon and Rees. And last but definitely not the least, Anthony Gooch, uh, Director of Public Affairs and Communications at the OECD. Now we all, just to kick it off, know that when we live in a digital world, it comes with, um, it's good, it's bad, and it's ugly. Um, on the upside, we all you know, make our lives easier, everything's at a touch of a button, uh, all of us have a voice on the downside, all of us have a voice, including our mothers, um, and that's not always great. But jokes aside, it also means negativity is massively huge in, um, um, in the digital sphere. The positives are also that we have enough data, and we're all plugging in data about ourselves that allows companies and governments to understand people, their needs. Uh, on the downside, that very same data gets misused, mishandled, and can be manipulated into anything and everything that somebody might want to change. So a question for all of us gathered here. I'm going to do a straw poll just to gauge for our panel where you all stand. How many of you have become more cautious about the data that you put online in the last two years? Are you more cautious now than you were two years ago? Fantastic. Majority of you guys. Um, how many of you have less interest in the world around you, in your society, your immediate society? I'm not talking about global affairs, but your immediate civic society um, because of all the negativity that seems to be out there. More so now than you were two years ago. So how many of you are less interested in governance, in government, in voting, things like that? More interested? Excellent. So we can now gauge that people are more cautious n now than they were two years ago about the data, but they are more interested in the world around them. So the question is, basically, if I can start with you, Sixteen, what is this thing about data and how much is too much data when it comes to civil society, civic life, and where do we draw the line? Just grab a mic. Oh, okay. um, I don't know whether we can say that there's too much data or not enough data, but I think that what is important is that we have kind of digital ethics that surround the data. And um, I think that this is, uh, for what concerns the European Union, this is one of the roles that we have to take responsibility for. And uh, we have to ensure that we have privacy of data and that we have transparency of data. So I think that we have put in place quite a lot of things. And you are certainly aware, for instance, of GDPR, which gives more control of data to people. And this has been put in force very recently. And we have also put other measures uh, as a, a code of uh, good practice with the online platforms just to struggle uh, against disinformation. So, uh, and in view of the upcoming elections in the European Parliament in May 2019, we also have reinforced and put in place a few more measures. But I think that what is really important is that it is not only for the public authorities to act, but we have to collectively act with the online platforms, local authorities, national governments, and the European Union. Clement? Pardon? I totally agree with what uh, Cécile just said. Maybe to add something, um, this question of data also asks a question about the purpose. 
uh, when you are regarding all the companies, when you are regarding what's happening in France now with the Act Law, uh, with the B Corp in the US, the purpose of what the company are doing with those data for their employees and for their salaries are a good issue now we have to face. When you think about IBM, when they um, built their first building in Chicago 100 years ago, in front of the office, you have the word think. When you are not looking at the ad campaign, it's always the good word think. So when your purpose is clear, when you have your employees, your consumer, your citizens, or all your stakeholders agree on this purpose, I think that data is maybe less an issue with those companies, with those others. Kevin, do you agree? Yes, for sure. I, I will build up on uh, what Clement just mentioned. From um, and, and my perspective would be to say uh, we think that good data is actually the data that enable uh, policy setting institutions, companies, and citizens as well to take uh, the best informed decision and evidence based decision. Uh, what we do at LinkedIn is to help uh, citizens, uh, so the members first, uh, the companies and uh, institutions, to leverage the power of data so that they can forecast, and in particular forecast the shift that is happening in the world of work. That is what we do with data. Uh, for sure, there's more transparency. The more data you have there, the more that you can delve into the companies that are setting forth the data in the digital age. So you are going to have much more knowledgeable voters. You're going to have much more knowledgeable workforce. They're going to know what their rights are within within their laws. There's so much more information. I, I started practicing law 28 years ago, even though I'm only 25 years old in my head. But regardless, <laughs> but I can tell you that it is such a vast difference from when I started practicing law 28 years ago versus now and just how educated the jurors are. The jurors know so much more now because they are delving into this digital age and they're taking it seriously. So many of us spend, they'd say three to four hours a day just gathering information through these search engines, which is, just gives you a wealth of knowledge. It's no longer Britannica and Encyclopedia, which I grew up with. Well, no, to tell me why is what I grew up with. So I'm 25 as well. Um, <laughs> Uh, Anthony, I think it really does come down to a question of how does how does the OECD, an organization like the OECD, then really look at the flow of data across the world and how it's impacting uh, citizens in both developing and developed countries? Because from the OECD's perspective, the research that you're sitting on must be as impressive as the kind of data that LinkedIn is sitting on. Well. I think we were, we were built around data before people became got into data. Before so it, it was, was fashionable. It, yes. Yeah. Uh, it was called statistics. And um, <clears throat> that is a really not a very nice name. And it also betrays something, which it was built uh, around the state. So at a certain point in time, that was very modern. But in today's day and age, uh, and we're confronting this uh, as well, I think it's very positive on, on many levels. Uh, you're moving into uh, an era where data is uh, citizen-centric. It's uh, generated by us individually, and it's harnessed and harvested in a very different way to how it was traditionally done, which was by national statistical uh, offices. Uh, to complement what my colleagues on the panel have said, I think that uh, the, the priorities uh, beyond the ones they have already mentioned, so I won't duplicate, are... Uh, I, Personally, we think that, um, and if you like, the explosion of interest in data is a very positive thing. Um, but there's a very important issue regarding accessibility on two levels. So the first thing is, uh, is uh, the data that is made available accessible by regular normal people? Is it something that you can uh, interpret, that you can understand uh, uh, yourself? Right? So I think that, that's very important. The, the source element uh, as well, can you trust it? Um, as you can imagine, for us, this is existential because we're all about trust. I mean, we don't have any money to lend anyone. We, we, we're not a well-financed organization. Anybody's got contributions to make, uh, see you after. We um, also don't have any uh, legal uh, recourse directly uh, ourselves. So we, we live, if you like, off reputation and off um, uh, that, uh, that trust element. The last thing I'd, I'd like to also point out is that in circles like these, we may think that everybody has access to data. Uh, even in countries like Turkey and Italy, 
uh, women have far less access to data than men. In the case of Turkey, it's 16% less. In the case of Italy, it's as high as six, which I find very surprising. Equally, there are countries like Australia and Brazil where women have a little bit more access to data uh, than men. But these are things that we have to think about in terms of accessibility, both the ability for a human being to be able to connect to it, but also do you actually have that access yourself? And as we're, we're at the Women's Forum and we're looking at the gender issues, there are some live issues there in a certain number of countries within OECD. The challenge is, uh, beyond OECD, as you can imagine, they then, you know, they, they, they're of a different order and a different nature to some of the stuff that we talked about, but mm -hmm. we may be able to discuss them a bit later. And I think we'll pick up on that because that's a critical element of accessibility and then also about accuracy. And I want to come back to the question about the accuracy of data because that does, um, that is going to translate very quickly in, in May for the European elections as well. But I do want to uh, do a little bit of a housekeeping note. I'm going to, um, after the next round of questions, maybe come to you and gather uh, two or three questions from you to the audience, uh, to the panel. Um, if you can introduce yourself, your company, um, and your question very briefly, um, that will be great because then we can really get down to the nuts and bolts of what you want to understand and take away from this particular session. So I want to come back to um, all of you when it comes to accuracy of data because we know it's out there. Um, how do we ensure that there's transparent data as Anthony was talking about, um, there is accuracy in the data, especially 16, in the run-up to something as critical as an election, because we've seen how data has been manipulated in the last couple of years. Um, how do we work together uh, as corporates, as international organizations, as governments, to ensure that is not the case again? If you can just pass a mic, that would be fantastic. Yeah, and I think it will not stop, but it will worsen in the months to come indeed. Uh, and we see everyday attacks, uh, and not only on the Commission, but to all the governments. And uh, what we are doing, we, we've put in place a code of best practice. So this is about self-regulation, i.e. the European Commission has requested the online platforms to develop mechanisms and to agree between them on how to be uh, more transparent, i.e. Uh, when it comes to uh, election campaigns, to have the same rules that uh, uh, apply online than the ones that apply offline, i.e. Uh, the fun uh, funding of these election campaigns should be made transparent, that uh, people should know more about uh, algorithm, how they work, uh, more about uh, alternative sources of information, and all the rest of it. So I think that this is, for the time being, it has been set up in July, and it is a, a self-regulation. But if it doesn't work out properly, because we'll report it by the end of the year, mm -hmm. we are envisaging other steps, i.e. to regulate. I think Fabian wanted to jump in on that one. Yes, more related to the accuracy standpoint. Um, at LinkedIn, because we connect in, in total 590 millions of members with all the skills, uh, 30 million companies. So based on the volume, first we do consider that the volume gives the proper accuracy. And each time that we build what we call an economic graph or a specific report or study with the policymakers, a cities, a region, we co-build and we collaborate very intimately so that we make sure that the questions that are asked and uh, the answers that are given are really accurate. So we are in position jointly to give to identify weak signal and to anticipate the shift that are going to happen. So that is the way we make sure it is accurate. Yeah, just that, that's a great point. I, the, the other part too is, is if you see something, say something because of the many members at LinkedIn, and I'm, I'm, I love your site, by the way, I use it every day, that's how we start to enforce it. We start to see that there are these inaccuracies or the, the fake news that's out there. Someone has to step forward because in order for, if for a large company like LinkedIn, however sophisticated you are, it's so difficult considering how vast the information that's in, that's populated there and aggregated there, it's very difficult for one entity to actually step forward and say they can regulate it. But all of us can do that. If we see something, we just simply have to say something and trigger the enforcement to remove what's false. So the 
enforcement doesn't always uh, follow through. We've seen that with Twitter. Um, I think Clement wanted to go next, and then Anthony will we'll pick up with you. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Mercedes just said. Um, just about fake news, I think it's also a question of global perception and global understanding. What happened in the US, what happened also in France, now I think that a lot of people who have access to information understand that you have to be really careful with the information you see on the WhatsApp everywhere. So the more people, the more media, the more everybody here have a common approach to fight this kind of fake news, the more the global perception will be better. But I think that in France now, um, a law will be published and discussed in the parliament at the beginning of next year, and it can have a massive impact on each life here. The, the thing that um, troubles me in, in this discussion is uh, how much of this is down to technology itself, how much of this is down to algorithms, as though these things have a power of their own. Now, certainly, artificial intelligence is growing. It isn't yet with us. We haven't reached singularity yet. So it's the human being who remains the primary actor. How much responsibility do we have in what is going on right now? And uh, when you realize that um, on Twitter, uh, wonderful research was done uh, and published in Science Magazine in March of this year, showing that human beings, since the creation of, of Twitter, human beings have a propensity to share uh, misinformation, uh, false stories, six times more than they will real stories, then we have to look at human nature. So we have to look at ourselves and what directions we go in. So the issue here around our personal self-regulation, because 16 cited uh, EU self-regulation in terms of the first half to say, look, before I regulate, I'll give you a chance. Uh, what, what type of behavior uh, are, we, uh, um, you know, are, are, are we showing ourselves? And do we have a propensity as human beings to seek out the salacious, the stuff that's uh, controversial, uh, et cetera? So that, that's, a, that's a more delicate issue for us to grapple with. I don't have a great answer for that one. I think the question then comes down to, uh, is the technology moving too fast for companies uh, and for governments to actually work together to, to come up with the solutions? We're talking about self-regulation. Uh, a lot of the technology companies uh, say, in hindsight, we could have done X, Y, Z, but we would have never known when, when the technology started. Uh, I, I can quote many social media CEOs who have gone out and said that. Uh, is the technology moving too fast for, for companies and regulators to be able to work together? Or is this a question of just two parties not understanding each other and that civil society gets left to handle and to report and to self-regulate and figure out what's right, what's wrong? Um, do, Fabian, um, Mercedes, if you want to, you want sure, to take that. If you look at, at the CEOs and the founders of some of these big digital companies, they come at, they're, they're nonconformists. That's their nature. So as nonconformists, they're going to buckle and bristle under government regulation. So who's best able to regulate? Those, those top executives that already have, who are so innovative, who are so brilliant, those, those unconventional folks that created these digital companies can turn around and say, well, I have to make that commitment to self-regulate, because frankly, it's so overly burdensome for the government. I do think, based on your question, it's absolutely perfect, and, and, and it's a brilliant observation because there is, a technology is outstepping government. I mean, technology's only been around, what, 15 years? And certainly, as at what it is today, it's only been, I would say, the last five that you've really seen in a, 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 the very sophisticated levels of the digital age come about and emerge. So I think it is outpacing government. I think the, the, the most important point is that we make sure that uh, we share the same challenges. Uh, again, if I focus off on the workforce and the employment, one of, those, one of the most important challenges that policymakers have to face, uh, in particular in Europe, is to prepare the workforce for the world of tomorrow, and in particular the world of the technology. So once a tech company, whatever it is, uh, and, and a policy uh, setting institution share the same cause, which is for us employment, then it's easy to move on uh, to make things progressing and to make sure that it is of the benefits of the citizens and to uh, unleash prosperity for everyone and to offer op economic opportunities at least. 
Clement, are you seeing this uh, with your clients that um, they are able to and are willing to work together uh, with government and, and, and civil society and uh, companies? I think so, because when you think about all the fights and all the scandals they have to face regarding data, I think that now all the companies have understood that it's a massive issue for them to collaborate with NGOs and governments to fight this kind of news. I mean, uh, think about Facebook, think about everything. You have massive candles, you have change of uh, behaviors for consumers, so it's a massive issue for them. But I think that um, Anthony made before the comparison between uh, data and statistics, it's the same between technology and progress. I mean, technology is here, progress is here, and you have to live with that. So the question, as Fabian said, is how you collaborate in the same way, with the same approach, in the same philosophy. Sixteen, do you find that when you're talking to national governments, they understand um, the critical aspect when it comes to working with all the actors involved? Uh, yeah, I think that there is a good understanding that we ha they have to work collectively with all actors, national, European, civil society. But then when it comes to translation into proper actions, it may differ indeed. And, uh, but I just wanted to, 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 to come back to uh, something that was said beforehand. Uh, and uh, Anthony, you said that it was also the responsibility of citizens of, uh, to, to be alerted. And uh, um, I have seen a figure which is quite interesting. Uh, 80, over 80% 80 of people access information through aggregated driven information and search engines. And at the same time, the same proportion are scared or aware about fake news and disinformation. So I would say that this is really a collective effort and from citizens as well. And I think that all the platforms have put in place buttons so that the, you can report what is wrong and that the online platforms will take responsibility for removing the content, which is good as well. Did you want to add anything to that, Anthony? Yeah, uh, we I love sharing on this panel. I don't want to leave you micless. Um, I'm going to disagree a little bit. Uh, I, um, I think we've got ourselves into a situation that we weren't really ready for. Um, the companies that have grown from being things out of the back of a garage in Harvard University and have now two billion uh, customers, clients, contributors, they never ever planned for this world. Just take a look at the New York Times article today and uh, you will see uh, how challenging, and I'm being British euphemistic kind, uh, Facebook's leadership uh, has found the last three years. And Facebook has been around for a long time. So the confidence in the innovative leaders out of the back of their garages to develop a Facebook and to think that those self-same people have what it takes to essentially um, be guardians of the values of humanity, I think is asking them something that they can't deliver on. And that's not what they got into, that's not what they signed up for. And part of their problem is that they are discovering on a daily basis how awful and complicated all of this is. So for a long time, I think what they were doing was, oh, this is not my problem, you know, I produce a platform. What people put on it, that's not my problem. So it was a, a safe harbor principle, as the EU and the US called it at one point. So the platform providers, not my problem. To realize it is, because you have a, a responsibility, you have a duty of care. I mean, if you were a pharmaceutical company and you were argued that one, how far would you get? Even the banking industry now has got to the point where they realize that they're after the financial crisis. So I think we're also in a, in a space here where we have to recognize that we have, we have quite a lot of challenges. You also have to recognize that, that global governance, at the, you know, it's never been easy. Now it's super unpopular as well, but it's never been more necessary when you look at something like that. You can't legislate for this at a national level. You can't legislate for this even at a European level. You have to le legislate for this at a, a, at a global level, you, or you have to manage it at a global level. And that's a very difficult thing to do because you have nation states that still are the unit of currency for international cooperation. I think you have a lot of people at the top of these entities that are 
still very unprepared. So if everyone's honest and just says, okay, we've got a lot to do here, mm -hmm. but you have to have the same goals in mind, and there I agree with you, but you've got to have the same purpose. Yeah. And the notion of progress is one I would question a little bit as well. I think in Western society, we always think that we're on a, a progression. We may be in regression at the moment and collective stupidity rather than collective intelligence. Hopefully we can get through that, but we have to recognize where we are today. Evolution is always in stages, isn't it, Mercedes? Yeah, Anthony, I disagree on a couple of brilliant arguments, but I'm going to disagree respectfully. When you talk about Facebook, you have shareholders. I mean, there's a built-in reason why these senior executives have to comply. One, you have regulation through the government. But you have shareholders that can bring lawsuits and say, you haven't protected our interest and our shares within the, within the company. So when you have this huge collection of individuals, not only are there the watchdogs on a daily basis saying, hey, by the way, what's, what's being disseminated on your website is false, therefore it needs to be take, taken down. You also have owners as shareholders who turn around and say, Facebook, you've let us down, and as a result, we're going to bring a lawsuit of a, a class action of an enormous magnitude against you because you didn't protect the company, you didn't protect our proprietary interests. So there are all these levels and all these safeguards and all these mechanisms that are triggered when you have a company that itself regulates because the downfall is so tremendous. You have social media. Well, setting aside your shareholders, you have the social media fallout. When you have... So in the social media realm, when you have people criticizing your company severely, it will affect your stock. We have loads of data about how companies that are, that are severely criticized within the, in this digital era, they get impacted financially, their bottom line gets impacted, shares go down in stock. So there's lots of reasons why these companies will self-regulate. Again, they're incentivized on many different levels. I'm curious to see what Fabian has to say to that. Yes, I will give the LinkedIn perspective only. Uh, <laughs> only. We do not speak here for anyone else. Uh, the point is that we, we do consider that it is critical to achieve our mission, uh, which is to uh, connect people and, and, and offer economic opportunities to all the professionals, that we offer um, a trusted and safe environment for them to share. If we are not in, possible, in position and it's it is true for every one of us to champion this safety and this data privacy, then we do not offer uh, this opportunity to the members and we do not achieve our mission. So it is just a fundamental for us and it is core of everything we do. I wanted to come to you all and, uh, and get your perspective on the questions you had. Uh, we have our wonderful hostess with the mic here. So uh, if anyone has a question, raise your hand. I'm going to try and take one or two at the same time. We've got one in the back row and then one in the front. Um, hi, and thank you very much. My name is Lucille Collin, and I'm from Girls Santé, which is an organization that seeks to uh, involve young women into uh, global policy making. And I want to pick up on this uh, discussion about the liability of platforms. And your question? Yeah, the, on the liability on platforms. Um, if illegal content is published on a newspaper, maybe online or offline, the editor-in-chief will be legally, penally responsible for this, and he or she may go to prison for this. So I'm a bit, uh, we see with the Facebook scandals that self-regulation, in my opinion, doesn't seem to work. So I'm wondering what exactly the European Commission would be uh, ready to do in case we see that self-regulation doesn't work concre concretely and when. Thank you. And if you can pass the mic on in the front, uh, right there, please. Thank you. Your name, organization, question. Oh, right, it's me already. Okay. Uh, Jane Griffiths, Johnson & Johnson. So as I listen to you, I mean, I feel that some regulation is necessary. I think you can't keep putting nonsense onto a platform and not I have any responsibility for somehow weeding it out. I mean, I work in the pharmaceutical industry, and before you and publish any data, it has to be peer-reviewed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I'm wondering if you see any parallels with the production of plastics. Big industry for years has spewed out plastic. Every company, it's a great material, but now it's polluting the environment. And now companies are, are plastic producing companies. People that use it are you know, taking on the responsibility of saying we need to do something about this in the world. And I just wonder if it's just a matter of time. And the question is? It's, well, I want to ask, is it a matter of time before the big platforms say actually it is our responsibility, just like, 
companies that use plastic. It's their responsibility to work with governments and with society to try and clean up the planet. It's a physical pollution rather than a, a sort of... Uh, Mercedes, you want to take that? Yes. And then I'd like to ask Sixteen to pick up on the first question. Yes, uh, that's a brilliant observation, Jane, because the reason why these plastic companies are coming forward, it's because of the social conscience that surrounded them. They were starting to get criticized over and over and over again because they're populating, they're polluting the world. I mean, uh, the world, uh, I think it was one bottle takes 600 years to disintegrate in a landfill. One bottle of water. So because of that, so here's this social conscience that is being really just organized because people like all of us here are, are pounding these companies saying, you have to do more, you have to do better, you are destroying our world. That's why they came forward. It was, it was that social conscience that came to the, to the forefront, which is why it was done. Clement, do you agree that this is about social conscience and it's... I, I totally agree with that. Um, to be perfectly honest and straight, we are working for companies uh, which are facing this kind of uh, issues with plastic. It's totally true. I mean, it came from NGOs, it came from consumers, and it also came from apps like Yuka and others, which helped consumers to understand what is beyond the business. So when you have a global awareness about this issue, companies are moving. Fabian, is, this, is, is regulation unnecessary? That's a really, really harsh question. I want to answer to that. Go no, on. I was asking. I'm asking Fabian. Uh, do we? Do you, as a company, want regulation to answer to answer the the two perspectives here? Is yeah. it Actually, if if is I, that easier? Yeah. For you? Um, regarding regulation, if I take just the example of GDPR, yeah. the way we approach GDPR was for us at LinkedIn as a as a global opportunity to make sure that. Um, we are consistent not only from a European perspective but also at a global level. So we really uh, focused on three things. First is clarity, give clarity on which data is going to be used and how. Um, consistency, clear usage of the data in everything that we do. And third one is control, which is to make sure that the members has the control on the data that we are using and giving clear information and advertising on what we are doing with the data. So for us, regulation are viewed as a, an opportunity to progress and to improve the members' experience. Sixteen, let's, let's get to the question of what if self-regulation doesn't work? Well, I think that the first thing is that we have to wait and see a bit because you can't uh, start self-regulation and immediately go to regulation. So I think that uh, the online platforms are aware of what they should do. But of course, if we see on the occasion of this report that it doesn't really work, we will go to regulation. But at the same time, you know, it's very difficult. We can't be, let's say, the kind of ministry of truth. And it's very difficult to differentiate between what is hate speech, disinformation? Uh, so, uh, we have taken already provisions uh, against hate speech. This is already in built in legislation. But then, when it comes to disinformation, we can not only ask online platforms to do something, but we have set up also a network of fact checkers, of independent fact checkers, and we will help them with a platform. So I think that this is still the responsibility of different actors to get to a better situation. But for the time being, wait and see. Anthony, are you finding in the kind of uh, data, and sorry, statistics um, that uh, you've been looking at over the years that young people, there's a term that's thrown around, um, the super civic youth and minorities, are they reacting differently? to the kind of pace of flow of the information itself or um, changing the way governments and companies are having to look at uh, the data, like uh, Fabian was saying, mm. about all of the criteria that they have to check off. Are you seeing that across the board? The super civic youth driving yeah. the agenda? So I, th I think that um, we have two phenomena at, uh, at play. Um, firstly, we have generations who are born uh, in these spaces, so they're termed digitally native. I'm a hybrid, for example. I'm 
part of me reads newspapers physically, part of me is, is, is an online uh, persona. And um, I think those who are in the digital native space, they are products also of digitalization in its most recent form, because that began in the 1950s. It's not a new phenomenon, but the um, acceleration in the last uh, decade has been huge and exponential, so it's, uh, it's turbocharged. What, what that means is I think that there is a gap between digitally native generations and their predecessors. And I'm seeing this, for example, I run a parliamentary network at the OECD. I've got legislators who are young who come in and say, we, we know this world, and there aren't legislators in parliament. They have no idea. They do not know. They'll tell us privately. I don't know what we're talking about here at all. And that's a problem when you're looking at framing uh, uh, issues because what I, I, I didn't get into the issue about, if you don't mind me coming back on the regulation, non-regulation, I didn't mention the word regulation in what I said. And even then, when people, people make um, semantic and sort of images in their mind, like regulation is bad, government is bad, free your minds from some of this stuff and just say, look, human beings, whenever they're confronted with problems, they try and sit down and work them out and then they try and find rules and paths to, so that everybody can get on with things. And if you don't have that, then societies cannot function. So let's evacuate the issue of big government or regulation in a negative sense and just say, how do human beings organize their societies? But what I'm positing is that we actually need a real multi-stakeholder group to come together with a lot of the, the talents and a lot of the different complementarities that, that they have in order to uh, confront those situations. But if people are washing their hands, that doesn't work. The, the other element is when you're digitally naive. And that's, I think, an issue where you look at the uh, younger generations. Where is critical judgment in younger generations? Now, this is not to say that you should all become cynical as young people. But you need to, to, you need to be alive. Just as, I mean, I've got young kids and I tell them, look, you have to watch out for strangers. You don't want to be unfriendly to everyone, but you have to do the same thing online. And I didn't have that when I was a kid because there wasn't an online world. So that exercise of critical judgment among the digital natives who have a propensity to be digitally naive is something I think that the younger generations, that that needs to be addressed through digital education, your personal stuff and what's provided for you at school, etc. Um, because it's a whole, it is a whole new world that, the, that you're entering into with ethical uh, value-based uh, elements and manifestations, some of them that are not new, online bullying, things like that. Clement, uh, if I can ask you one question before going back to the audience uh, for, for one last question. Um, do you have a great example in the, in the cities that you guys work with uh, where the connectivity issue, the self-regulation issue, all of those have somewhat been touched upon as an example that we can look up to? Yes, I would, could, I would quote two examples, one uh, in the city of Manchester uh, in UK uh, and the other one in France, uh, in the region Haute-France, which is the region where the unemployment rate is the highest in France. Um, and in both cases, we jointly work with the, the institutions to highlight what are the hidden skills of the region or of the city, what should be developed and which companies could be attracted so that the employment rate could improve. So that is, on those two cases, uh, examples of collaboration in which we work to improve the employment and offer jobs, opportunities, uh, develop educational programs so that we make sure citizens are going to um, benefit from the progress of the technology. Yeah, ju just to add something very quick, um, just to understand what we are talking about when you are dealing with access and information. Just regarding France, you have 7 million people who never went on the internet. 7 million people. That's the first thing. And when you are looking at the global landscape, uh, you have 52% of the world who, didn't, who don't sorry, have access to the internet. So everything we are dealing about, we have to keep that in mind because it's maybe more easy to have access in uh, big cities rather than in haute France, for example. And I think that brings back the point that Anthony was making, that there are women in a number of these countries that also lack that access because of many, many other societal issues. I want to take a, uh, one last question from the audience, if you have one. Uh, the lady there, and yeah, if you can just pass the mic, uh, if we have one. Our mic gets lost but we found it. Hello, Christina Peel from PwC. My question is, 
Surely self-regulation in digital age has to be a different kind of self-regulation, more accepting of ethicists and other perspectives, uh, and different kind, and maybe accepting of design thinkers, right? Because old self-regulation of just the industry players by themselves will not get us in a better place, particularly when in certain cases, the business model puts the business interest in direct contradiction to users' interests. So I'm looking for new approaches that you've heard of, uh, practices by online platforms that will cause a race to the top, not a race to the bottom. That's a really interesting question. Mercedes, uh, your clients, and you vociferously stood for this, um, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting point. Businesses will first look out for shareholders and their business interests. Have you seen some of your clients take that on board, that you need to get everybody involved? You know, that's such a brilliant question. I almost feel like you should be sitting here answering it for the rest of the audience. I, I do think that there are companies that ha embrace corporate culture. I, I can't think of, I mean, there are these tech companies that we represent, I'd rather not mention them by name, but there are tech companies who are forward thinking, out of the box thinkers who say, if the stronger you embrace your workforce and provide opportunity, it does drive the bottom line. And if you understand that by embracing corporate culture and making it a culture that, that your employees are excited to work there and feel appreciated and want to work hard for the company because they feel appreciated, it will impact the bottom line. So I do think, and these are the companies that I'm thinking of in my mind, those clients that really do embrace that corporate culture and really do want to have their employees feel appreciated are the ones that are going to be the, the, the difference makers. Because I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it, you can't have this blanket, the regulations will deal with it, government will deal with it, or the opposite side, self-regulation will do it. It really is case by case, company by company, and it is that moral barometer that, that goes within these top executives to say, we're going to make a difference because it's the right thing to do. I think we've touched on quite a few things and f uh, that are topical, and I know we read about it, we debate it, um, we probably will get into a Thanksgiving dinner um, argument about it because it's safer than talking about other things. Um, so I'd like to come back to all of you because I think the, the critical aspect of this is to walk away with some takeaways that are implementable in our own lives and our own organization. So if I can ask you, Sixteen, um, how do we amplify a citizen's voice in civic society with all of the considerations that we know are hanging about us? Well, I think that there is probably one dimension that we haven't really touched upon is also media, lit uh, media literacy. And I think that uh, this is something that we should, again, collectively take responsibility for. And uh, may the, the, the platforms, the, the private sector, but also the, the public authorities at all levels. I think it is very important to give people more competence, more skills about what they will find online. So uh, if I were to give a recommendation, I think that this should be something that we should really focus on because uh, it's really empowering people to uh, use in a better way, in a more civic way, uh, social media and the digital, uh, I mean the web uh, as a whole. Clement? A key implementable takeaway for civic society in a digital age. Okay, just please allow me to answer something else. Go for it. Just um, to emphasize something that explains that sometimes technology can help on some stuff. Two days ago, the Financial Times decided to put a boat into their own redaction to help journalists to understand that only 21% of the quotes in their articles were female quotes. 21% mainly on health and energy issues, never in defense, Never in banking, never in science, whatever. So maybe one of the most popular media decide with technology to help their own journalists, to help women experts to be more in their journal. So it's something else, but I, I find really interesting that sometimes technology can help people to understand and to leverage 
and help women to be more in media. I think that's really fascinating considering that the top five uh, women in the defense, uh, the, the top five leaders in the defense industry are women. That's, that's an interesting idea. I mean, if you had to give a key takeaway to say, okay, go, in, go back to your organization, whether it's an NGO, a company, or in government, what would that be? Uh, first, I'd like to touch on, on the notion of progress that Anthony slightly addressed. And my takeaway would be um, that we should embrace the technology and the TADAS world as a tremendous opportunity to spread up learning, get new skill, and share knowledge. And for me, that is the progress. How do we make sure we share learnings, we share the progress, and we share knowledge among all the people? For, by the way, that turned off, so that's why I took it off. I, didn't want, I don't want you, anyone to think I'm being rude. <laughs> Every one of us has such tremendous power at the tips of our fingertips when we strike that keyboard. And every one of us has that ability to make a change. And if and through our collective voices and through our collective power, we will make that change. I have seen enormous change in 20 years, eight years of practice. And the companies that are in the forefront of making those changes are because they are, have that, that moral conscience that's watching them. They're the watchdogs. It's what every one of us collectively can make that change. Um, big lesson. Uh, I think uh, what we need to do, certainly an organization like mine, is uh, for you be far better listeners. When you listen, you have to have a commitment to absorb. So, for example, if you consult someone, the measure of a good consultation is the degree to which you change what you originally had in mind, and the end product could be quite different, and that will be a positive. And the third piece is to act on it. Now I'm going to do a little plug because we've tried an exercise in listening. Um, it's also offering uh, you something. It's going to be profiled straight after this uh, session by my colleagues and it's called the OECD Better Life Index and it's designed to try and find out what's most important to you in your well-being. So it's a listening exercise for us and for you to know what's most important in your life. But the, the missing piece is, what do we do next as OECD with an initiative like that? What do you think we should do next? Because we don't know. So it, that, that's that element where um, this isn't just a plug. It's also a question to you to help us um, move, move the ball forward. Because I fully agree regarding harnessing all of the potential of technology. Look, I've got this thing on my wrist. It tells me how many steps I've done, what my heart rate is. I don't have to go to a doctor, hopefully, or take drugs and all sorts of things like that if I look after myself. So we can all, uh, all of us see that. The stuff I've got on this phone is fantastic. It's unbelievable. My level of productivity has gone through the roof. The OC doesn't measure that. It's not in GDP, that type of productivity yet, you see. But um, I, I invite you to look at this uh, initiative because it's, it's quite powerful. But what could be the power that we could generate from something like that for the future? Because it, it fits exactly what you were talking about in terms of progress rather than regression. Well. Can I say thank you to my panel uh, for highlighting something very key? I know I go around the world trying to figure out how people are thinking about technology and actually on a stage. Uh, it's gone from f four or five years ago of fearing technology to saying, okay, it's an opportunity. Now, do we look at it as something we have to control or look at it as an evolution? And the evolutionary process, I always find, has hiccups. And this might be the point where um, some of that technology is going to land up like the Neanderthal man or we are going to end up with the Homo sapiens. And sometimes we just need to talk to each other just to understand how quickly that evolution process is happening. So thank you very much to my wonderful panel and thank you very much for joining us in this conversation. Hopefully civic life is going to get a little bit easier as much as uh, the traffic in Paris might not. Thanks again.